pathology in a few hours is, is a really challenging task because it is a very comprehensive topic. I hope to still give you an idea of the main diseases uh, that we see and uh, I will focus on domestic animals since that is what we see primarily. Um, but before I will start I want to acknowledge one of my co-authors, Jim Render, who contributed with images to this presentation. Um, and remember that at least as pathologists, are we all pathologists here or do we have clinicians, practitioners? Yeah. Okay, so as pathologists, we, we tend to only look at one or a few sections generally vertical uh, because most of the animals that we evaluate have a tapetum on the dorsal aspect and a non-tapetal region in the ventral aspect and there may be some difference and so generally we trim the eyes vertically and end up then with a section that looks like this but we need to remember that the eye is a three-dimensional closed structure and changes that happen at the posterior aspect, perhaps a retinal detachment or so, can end up having an effect at the anterior aspect, lead to preerido fibrovascular membrane formation, for instance. Or we may have changes such as glaucoma where the primary problem is anterior, but we would then see changes in the retina. So again, it's, it's a closed environment where changes will end up having an effect then globally, if you will. And when we as pathologists get to see the eye, sometimes it's an end stage, so hopefully we have some history that help us in evaluating what the initiating problem is. But even if we don't, we can still try to see if we come up with the timeline to define what was the initiating problem and what was the end result. And I will be commenting more on that as, as we go through. So one of other aspects that we need to remember of the eye is that its main function is the vision that happens at the posterior aspect. And for light to reach that, it needs to go through several transparent media, starting with the cornea. So again, they need to be transparent. If we have any change there, that will impact vision. So cornea is one of these media. Then the aqueous humor would be the next. The lens is the third. And finally, the vitreous body. Again, all of these need to be transparent so that light can flow through and reach the retina for the image to form properly. And so if we have anything that interferes with this, that will interfere with vision. So we need to keep that in mind too as we evaluate the eye if we have the history of blindness or so, for instance. So again, coming back to this histologic mm -hmm. section, we also need to keep in mind that the eye is quite challenging to trim. And this one here is a section where artifacts are minimal. We still have a little bit of tearing of <coughs> tissue in some locations here. But again, we need to be careful as we evaluate the eye section as pathologists that we don't interpret artifacts as being potential real changes. 
and I will point out some of these things as I go through the lecture. So this is basically how I have divided it up before and after the break. I will be talking about developmental and degenerative diseases in the initial part, and then inflammatory and neoplastic diseases in the second part. Again, focusing on domestic animals. So let's start with the developmental diseases. And before I do that, I want to just quickly review the normal embryologic formation of the eye so that we can better understand the developmental changes. So remember that everything starts with these optic vesicles that are bilateral and they come off the forebrain here. And so again, we have the optic vesicles that will interact with the ectoderm. And we can see that there is this thickening here that is the lens plug hole that will give rise to the lens by budding in, forming this lens vesicle initially that will be lodged here by the optic cup. So this vesicle here will invaginate and form an optic <coughs> cup that lodges the lens vesicle that is arising from this ectoderm here. And all of this at this stage is surrounded by connective tissue. Notice that we have this what will end this optic stalk that will then eventually um, give rise to the optic nerve that will always remain as that connection with the brain. So here in C, we see a little bit further uh, than this development where the lens vesicle is now basically separated from the ectoderm. And again, the optic cup. It is important to remember that the optic cup is basically this bilayered structure, if you will. Here is looking at it from a three dimensional aspect to basically highlight that at the beginning of the development, we have this fissure along the ventral aspect where the vessels are coming out. So if you had noted here these vessels, they are coming out of the fissure that we see here that goes all the way through initially. Here it would be at the level of the optic nerve, again, basically with this fissure here lodging the primitive vasculature. This fissure should close because obviously the eye should be a closed structure. And so again, these vessels will end up being incorporated then into the globe, into the optic nerve. And so as we will be talking about coloboma later, that means that this fissure here did not close completely. So here this is now a bit further advanced and so again all the vasculature is now incorporated into this forming globe, into the optic nerve. Going back to looking at that in a two-dimensional way, here we already see the layers better defined. So remember it was that bilayered structure with the outer aspect and basically then of that neuroectoderm giving rise to the RPE that is this very fine layer that is between the retina that is the inner layer of that optic uh, cup and that is surrounded by some connective tissue with the sclera forming the outermost aspect here we can see the sclera already defined 
and then a pigmented layer that is the choroid and the anterior uveal tract, iris, and ciliary body at the anterior aspect. And the, the ectoderm will fold over and form the eyelids that will then close. And so here we can see these folds of the ectoderm closed as the closed eyelids. And the, as the globe continues to form, we can see that we still have these, ves these vessels that go up to the lens. So if we do the histologic evaluation of a fetal eye or of a kitten or puppy as they are just born and the eyelids are still closed, we can then see some small vessels that are surrounding the lens that basically represent that initial vasculature that is there helping to provide vascular supply to all these forming structures. So this one here is then pretty much the eye ready then at the time of birth of those animals that just come out and get running like ruminants, like horses, again in dogs, cats, that development is still finishing up then during their first few weeks of life. And there is a canal that is basically a virtual canal that would then still remain within the vitreous body that corresponds to where we had the hyaloid artery coming up and getting out all the vessels around the lens. But by the time that the eyelids open and the animal is basically worn, ready for life, we should have a globe that basically looks like this. That we can divide basically in two ways. We can look at it, uh, basically dividing it up into anterior and posterior compartment. And we would then draw the line more or less at this level here, with the anterior compartment having the anterior chamber that is this space here between the cornea and the iris leaflets and the posterior chamber between the iris leaflets and the ciliary body. And so it is common that trainees and sometimes even pathologists who are not used to looking at the eyes to call posterior chamber what is actually the posterior compartment uh, comprising the, fit, the vitreous body. So as we communicate to practitioners and to ophthalmologists, we need to be careful as pathologists that we use this terminology correctly and that we remember that posterior chamber, this little space here, is different than posterior compartment that refers to this portion of the eye here. Another way of looking at the globe is by looking at the different tunics that I had pointed out before, with the fibrous tunic being the most external one with the sclera going up here uh, anteriorly with the cornea. The vascular tunic that is generally pigmented, that will be kind of the middle tunic uh, with the choroid posteriorly and then the iris and the ciliary body anteriorly. And then finally, internally, the sensory tunic, which is comprised primarily by the retina, supported by the retinal pigmented epithelium. So with that quick review of the embryology and anatomy, I'm going to start talking about developmental diseases. They're in general uncommon but we may still see them, and mostly as you see them repeatedly, you may want to investigate some either genetic component or perhaps toxic or infectious. And finding out at what point the problem may have occurred is where it is important to realize and where could this problem have happened? It would have happened here already at the very beginning rather than having one kind of or two optic vesicles forming, this animal only had one optic vesicle 
forming. And so we ended up with a cyclopia here, which in the case of lambs is characteristically caused by Veratrum californicum. So in the US, they have this plant here that when ingested by sheep at day 14 of gestation, so day 14 of about five months of gestation, we will end up then with a problem like this. They may have other malformations, um, but basically important to remember that this is something that happened at the very beginning of the lobe formation and potentially brain formation. Often then it is associated with other facial deformities. And so here we have a pig that also has other problems. We can see here the mouth is small form and we also have this large proboscis. Generally we would have brain malform. Uh, in the case of pigs, classical spine fever is certainly, or hog cholera, is certainly an infectious cause that when it affects the sow at a very early stage of gestation, it can potentially culminate in something like this. Or nutritional issues can potentially look, uh, culminate into problems like these. In this particular case here, we had two globes that were trying to form, two optic vesicles that were trying to form. We can see that they have a partial division here. You can you know, get that idea here too. But they were lodged within the same orbit. And so in this case here, synophthalmus would be the term to use. Again, there was the attempt of separating into two different optic vesicles, but they remained so close that, the, that they ended up sharing the same orbit. That it was the diagnosis that we thought we were dealing with here. Again, kind of, we have one orbit, and we got the impression that this bowl that we can see also had other malformations. Um, had again kind of these only partially separated globes. But in this particular case, we were surprised to find then through further dissection that the globes had actually almost completely separated. They were only after basically dissecting off the conjunctiva here, uh, only really attached by a little band of tissue. So this was even somewhat further ahead in the formation um, than the previous case that I showed. Yes, question. What is the name of this formulation? We still called it synophthalmia because it was sharing the same orbit. But it gives you an idea that there is a range of how well these may end up separating from each other. And again, Facial deformities, and there were also brain abnormalities in this fold as well. Now, moving on with malformations, sometimes we may have the impression there is no blow whatsoever, no eye formation, just kind of a little slit where the eyelids should have been. And when we look at that histologically, we may truly not see any eye formation. So this may be a true case of anophthalmia, where all we have are the eyelids and the glands, but no blow formation at all. Now this is very rare. What is more common is that clinically it may appear we are dealing with anophthalmus, but when we look more carefully, we actually find a small primitive globe within that orbit. So in this particular case, we would then have microphthalmia. In ruminants, as this case here was, there has been always the speculation that palpation, that may have been a little rough, kind of to see if the dam was, if the cow is pregnant, someone then palpates and potentially is a little rough with the embryo 
that that could be a reason for this, but a study has not been able to prove that that is truly the case. So again, while palpation has been claimed to be like that you should not have vet students who are practicing, learning how to palpate, that they may be causing this kind of lesion that has not been proven to be true. BPD is a more likely cause of microphthalmia. Here is then the histologic section of that little globe where we can see the third eyelid that is basically the same size as the whole globe. So that gives you an idea of the proportions. Uh, often these are just little cystic structures. And so basically then the empty space in the center and then more or less layers around the periphery. We can see, we can get an idea here that there is a vascular layer. Often you can find that this is the beginning of the retinal layer um, that represents then that neuroectoderm that, uh, from that optic vesicle that we saw before. Now albinos, so sometimes ocular problems can be associated also with skin problems. We will see that can be with acquired diseases. In this case here, it is a congenital malformation. In this particular case, it was in buffaloes, where you can see this herd had normal animals, but then also some that were basically heterozygous, uh, homozygous recessive, that had this melanin problem, if you will, that affected not only the skin, but also the eyes they may actually sometimes look bluish rather than having this white appearance. In rodents or in rabbits, we often see the red eye. Uh, any thoughts why those eyes look so red? Does anyone know why in albinos? It's because of the blood that is basically then shining through that that the pigment does generally not allow us to see. So very good. Now in Dobermans, um, they have a particular type of albinism that actually ends up predisposing them to some melanomas. So they still have melanocytes, they just have a defect in the melanin production, and those um, these Dobermans, they actually, over time, can end up developing neoplasms of those defective melanosomes, melanocytes. And so that can happen within the skin, but also within the eye. And so here, again, within the skin, within the eyelids, often it is at the level of the eyelids where we see these problems but then also within the eye itself. So here we can see it within the iris. So again, this is a known problem that these Dobermans will end up developing. Now, many of the diseases, I will just kind of start talking it from the anterior most aspect, walking all the way to the posterior aspect. And so starting with the eyelids, continuing basically to talk about the skin, Remember that we have entropion and ectropion. Uh, so entropion, where the eyelids are bent inward, and depending on how much then the eyelashes will affect, will touch the cornea, that will cause more or less damage and exudate, as you can see in this sharp tape. Ectropion, where they are everted, so outward bent, and uh, we can see that the problem that these dogs and basset hounds are classic mm -hmm. for that, they will end up developing conjunctivitis. So basically we have this reddening because the constant exposure then of the conjunctiva. Cornea may be changed, we may have microcornea where we would see more of the sclera than we usually do, or we may have 
macrocornea or megalocornea, where we would then have bulging out of the globe. And, it, and that is often associated with other malformations as well. And horses, that is particularly seen in breeds that have this somewhat silver type of hair color. And so there again, that is just one of the indications of ocular disease malformations that they have. Then an interesting malformation from a clinical perspective is the corneal dermoid. So basically you can see how what is like normal skin in the adjacent area is also present either at the level of the conjunctiva or more or less also over the cornea. And here again, the problem are then these hairs that may then be damaging the cornea. So corneal dermoid, in this case here it is in a dog, but like for instance, Hereford cattle can have that. Um, I've seen it in a deer where it was so large that it was basically just filling or occluding the whole cornea to where the animal was blind on that one side. So that can certainly be another problem. It is very easily corrected by surgery. It, it is uncommon that we get it as pathologists, but in this particular case here, they submitted it for evaluation and histologically, it then generally just looks like normal skin. And that's also what it looks like grossly. It's just normal skin in the wrong location. And so from a pathology perspective, looking at this may be rather boring. It's much more interesting when we see it in situ clinically. Now, corneal dermoid can again be part of a number of other malformations. So that was the case of this kitten. So you can see here, it's, uh, it's hard to even see what is the anterior versus the posterior aspect of this eye. But this happens to be where the cornea should have been, where we can see this large bulging structure. So this is an eye bisected. So we can see the two halves here. This was a smaller eye than usual. So this kitten had microphthalmia with large dermoids of which I'm showing you the histole. So again, this here is where we should have seen the cornea, and instead we had this large outbulging structure of haired skin. And here is where we have then kind of the small globe with some uveal tract. It had also other malformations, basically malformed structures internally in general. So this kitten was certainly blind, not just because of this dermoid, but also because of other malformations internally. Now, it is not always easy to differentiate congenital malformation from acquired, because they can very much look the same. So then the history that has been there, basically since birth, is really helpful. In this particular case here, it is an epithelial inclusion cyst. So um, this is before and after surgery, where we basically just have this little round structure that when looked at histologically corresponds to what in this particular case here, they diagnosed in a llama, where we have this squamous epithelial line structure. Here it is in a higher mag where we can see the squamous epithelium that as it is producing then the keratin and sloughing it off and so on will certainly continue to increase in size. And so certainly blocks vision in that location and until it is then resected surgically. This is also something that if there is anything that allows the lining epithelium to basically invaginate as an acquired condition can then occur and look similarly. And as long as you let the lining epithelium invaginate due to the result of some trauma, sectioning or so superficial, and that epithelium migrates down, it can potentially create this kind of cystic structure as well as an acquired change. <laughs> 
Here, um, what would be considered a congenital malformation is basically corneal dystrophies. And these are non-progressive corneal diseases where we have deposits within the cornea that histologically may represent some lipid or it may even ha be hard for us to recognize histologically what exactly leads to this crystalloid deposition. Though we often don't see that because from a clinical perspective, they may recognize this as a non-progressive disease that while it impacts vision a little bit, the dog gets used to it and so would not really cause any problem to the point of warranting uh, pathologic evaluation. So just something to be aware of that there are these corneal dystrophies out there. Then pupillary membranes. They're again a lot more interesting from a clinical or gross aspect. Remember we had that connective tissue that was surrounding the internal structures during embryology? They should disappear. They should regress. That did not happen in this particular case here. So some of that connective tissue remained. In this particular case here, it is going over to the, to the lens. And so it is causing a little bit of a localized degeneration of the lens. But getting to see them histologically is rather kind of like a, a, l being lucky, if you will, because they are often very thin structures that may end up not getting included in a histologic section. So they can either go from the cornea over to the iris or from the iris over to the lens. And again, they represent basically then some of that connective tissue that was surrounding these internal structures and that should regress completely. You may still see them during the first few weeks of life in puppies primarily. So if you see them in very young dogs, it's good to wait a little bit further because they can still regress. Again, the eyes are still forming in dogs and cats during their first few weeks of life. Now, anterior segment dysgenesis has these connective tissue strands as one of the characteristics. But there it, it generally goes beyond just some of those thin strands that I just showed you. In this particular case, there was not complete separation. Often, then you have this kind of linking the lens to the cornea and the decimase membrane is not allowed to basically form that barrier that you would want to see at the inner aspect of the cornea. So again, if in these cases of anterior segment dysgenesis, we have more than just the, these strands here. This particular case here, it highlights that the cornea did not form properly and is connected to the lens that you will have to imagine in this location here. Um, I've seen the best example of this type of malformation in snow leopards. And I will show you some other changes that those snow leopards then had as well, where they also had microphthalmia and some retinal changes. So, it would basically be at this stage here where the lens should have separated from the ectoderm where we would then see where there would have been a problem with that separation that did not happen completely in these kind of cases. Then uh, hypoplastic lesions affecting the, the uveal tract. So here this is the normal thickness you can see that it is very thin here, so not enough connective tissue uh, basically remains in this location here. So that is hypoplasia that can very much look like atrophy that we see in older animals. So again, another change where the congenital and basically then acquired age-related changes can very much look the same. In this particular case, we can see the whole 
the tip of the iris did not form. So um, basically that is what they are highlighting here where histologically we can see better. We have the ciliary body and the beginning, basically a little stump of the iris, but then everything else is missing. So just a case of basically, in this particular case, because the whole tip was missing, they even called it aneurysia in this particular course. Filtration angle, I will come back to that as I talk about glaucoma. So I just want to remind you that it is very important that we have adequate formation of the areal corneal angle here and that the connective tissue should allow, basically should then regress to a point where fluid can leave the globe adequately than at this level here. Fluid aqueous humor that will be formed by the ciliary body come through here between the tip and the iris and the lens will then kind of flow into the anterior chamber and should come out here. So if we look at fetal eyes or the eyes of very young puppies and kittens, we will see there is still a lot of connective tissue at this level that in a well-formed, completely developed eye should then actually have this kind of meshwork type of appearance where the aqueous humor can then go in either out into the sclera or basically then flow back here towards the choroid. And if we have a problem here, we have primary glaucoma, and I will come back to that. So this is just to introduce already then these cases where that did not regress completely and where this can certainly then lead to fluid buildup and intraocular pressure. Now, persistence of the hyaloid artery, remember that little vessel that we had back here, that may end up not regressing completely. And that is what we see here that then generally leads to cataract formation. So here we have a mouse where we can see that in addition to persistence of the vasculature here, we also have persistence of vessels that line the whole posterior aspect of this lens here. Here we have a somewhat lower mag, you know, indicates how extensive this lesion is, that generally is then associated with cataract changes along that posterior aspect. You can see that we also have retinal malformation in this particular case here, a lot of folds within this retina of this mouse. That may be a source of bleeding. And so here we can see that we have a little bit of blood in the fundus. So that may be associated with this remnant of the vasculature. So if in rodents you identify some blood in the fundus, then that may very well be coming from remaining vasculature in that location. In this particular case here, so I mentioned cataract can be a congenital problem associated just by itself or associated with these primary vitreous persisting within the globe. Uh, in this particular case, it is a lens that is actually reduced in size. So um, that can certainly be another problem where we have um, basically a not completely formed lens. Again, one of the problems that in bovine, this is a, um, we can see with BBD infection in utero. Coloboma, I already mentioned that before. That is what we see if that fissure doesn't close completely. And so here we can see basically if that is then still persisting all the way through up to the anterior aspect of the eyes. And more often it is actually just in the posterior aspect of the eyes and associated then very commonly with kind of these cystic outbulgings of the eye. In this particular case here, it was a raccoon that had microphthalmia and that had these cystic outpouchings that corresponded to coloboma formation. And 
very often the retina will end up detaching and so retinal detachment is then a common sequela. Cataract then often develops as well. Uh, in this particular case here on the left, this is a quali eye, uh, where we can also see choroidal hypoplasia. So it is not as heavily pigmented as we can see it in some regions here, as it normally should be. Here where it is less pigmented, these areas correspond to choroidal hypoplasia, which is a characteristic of coli anomaly that has coloboma as an additional feature. It's something that is a well-known problem and so we don't really see that much anymore nowadays. And so, um, again, in these cases of coloboma, it is very common that the retina detaches and so that evidently ends up then leading to blindness. And this one here is the snow leopard uh, that I mentioned before that had anterior segment dysgenesis and a microphthalmic lobe that also had retinal folds and some colobomatous change <coughs> then too. So again, often we see these congenital malformations uh, not just single, but kind of multiple of them occurring together. So with the retina, remember that we have multiple layers, and so it is important that as pathologists, we, are, we remember that we have a ganglion cell layer, basically as nuclear layers, we then also have the, the inner and the outer nuclear layer with the photoreceptors, and the inner and outer segments, and then the flexiform layers in between these other layers, and then the ganglion nerve fiber layer internally, um, so that we can evaluate whether there are any changes to the retina or not. In terms of developmental changes, this was one of the changes that we saw in some dogs with retinal dysplasia, and this one here basically just represents a fold. So sometimes if you have microphthalmia, the retina does not have enough space to stretch out. And so you end up then with folds, then as we can see it here. Some of those dogs also had more than just folds. Uh, actual rosette formation here had actual retinal dysplasia. And so that was a more extreme manifestation of the retinal issues that um, you can end up seeing <coughs> in animals. Again, either genetically induced or potentially uh, like herpes virus can do that in dogs, um, BVD can do that, or classical spine fever, so hawk cholera can do that in food animals. So if you have viruses that will end up interfering with the formation of the globe, will often then also cause cerebral changes, um, you would then have an infectious cause that you would want to investigate. In those dogs that we saw, uh, there were some dogs that ended up getting to be of older age. And so here is then complete retinal detachment that we saw in those cases. Notice how this globe here is also somewhat orange or yellow. That is because of a lot of hemorrhage that was associated, chronic hemorrhage with hemosiderin buildup. In this particular case here is then kind of the retina of that older dog. And so dysplasia in an older dog is really hard to confirm because you get degenerative changes and folding and so on that certainly happen on top of dysplastic changes. So we only knew this dog had retinal dysplasia because the ophthalmologist had evaluated this animal over its lifetime. So otherwise we would not have been able to make that call at seven years of age, which is when they enucleated this globe. So again, this was just a putpourri of um, the developmental diseases that are very uncommon compared to all the other ones. But as you would have them, it is important to kind of try to remember the embryology to figure out at what stage did that problem occur so that you can then investigate at basically is there an infectious cause that could have affected 
the mother then at that time, earlier, later in gestation or so. Um, so that, that will hopefully then help you in investigating that further. Any question on this before I go into the genitive diseases? So let's kind of browse through these. Um, so this is something that we have seen most commonly in Doberman. It is called ligneous conjunctivitis. So you would have to think of this as being really hard, like wood. So again, ligneous conjunctivitis. This is seen in association with plasminogen deficiency. And so this is basically fibrin that accumulates. And this is a special stain for fibrin. <coughs> All of this blue material here that corresponds to PTAH stained fibrin is accumulating then often in the conjunctiva, but can also be in the oral cavity and esophagus, even pericardial sac, and so on and can certainly interfere with vision, as you can see. So this is a problem that Dobermen are known to get with in association with plasminogen deficiency. In cats, uh, one problem that we have seen, and there is a paper that can appears published based on that, is the so-called uh, corneal, basically this keratopathy here, um, so this is severe edema that develops, unfortunately, often bilaterally, and these cats generally have to have their eyes enucleated. Uh, I've seen them trying to treat these with conjunctival flaps to try to contain all that edema and basically that expansion of the cornea, but that generally does not help. And so, again, this is a disease that eventually ends up affecting both eyes. These are generally cats that are being treated for systemic disease uh, with some anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressive drugs. So that seems to interfere potentially with the collagen that just makes it more prone to this corneal, excessive corneal edema, edema here. So basically corneal hydrops, excessive corneal edema, here we have the histology, where you can see that this basically just liquefies the corneal stroma and again, generally, unfortunately, leads to inoculation. Um, another well-known disease of these flat-faced cats uh, is the, uh, the, the, the sequestrum that is basically the structure here pigment accumulation that we see in the center of the cornea in association with basically complete necrosis of that corneal stroma. So often it is then taken out surgically, though it will eventually also lead to some granulomatous response that will lead to expulsion of that lesion as well. In this particular case here, it is a report of that kind of lesion in a dog. So again, we have this pigmented, basically, that portion of the superficial corneal stroma that in this particular case here already had quite a bit of reaction underneath. Uh, here we have a panus. So that's thought to be an immune-mediated disease that is then often treated with anti-inflammatories. And we often don't get to see that as pathologists. But from a clinical perspective, it has this advancing granulation tissue and pigmentation over the cornea, often advancing from the temporal region then over the eye and can certainly <coughs> affect vision quite a bit depending on how extensive this lesion is. <coughs> then, kind of moving a little further into the eye, an acquired change here is that atrophy of the iris that I mentioned before can very much look like the congenital hypoplasia of the iris. So in this particular case here, it is an older animal, and they're probably more sensitive to light as we lose stroma. Um, but otherwise, that's just kind of an acquired change that you would see in older animals. Cyst formation, 
So here we have um, the Purpura nigra and the Morsef. And you can see this large bulging structure here that represents a cyst in this particular case. The tumor could certainly look very similar. But where we see cysts more commonly is in dogs. And so golden retrievers, particularly, that get the pigmentary uveitis that from a pathology perspective does not really have much of an itis, but from a clinical perspective has some protein kind of aqueous flare that suggests leaky vessels. And that also have these cysts that generally form behind the iris and will then eventually kind of detach and break loose. And the problem of these is that they can end up then causing these adhesions of the iris to the lens or potentially occlusion of the filtration angle and so then eventually glaucoma. So from a clinical perspective, again, and it's then this pigment deposition that basically is secondary to those cysts forming that we can See also histologically, though we have to be really looking for them because they are very thin-walled and may end up rupturing as we process the eyes. So this often ends up being the end result of the pigmentary uveitis, where the iris is completely attached to the, to the lens here. And so you can see all that pigment and this thin connective tissue. Here this is an iris bombay where we have that C-shaped formation here indicating that we have complete blockage of the pupillary space. Uh, lens luxation, so or subluxation in this particular case here, that can be the result of trauma as was suspected of the horse here. So notice this is the normal position of the iris in relation to the lens. Here the iris is along the back of the, along the posterior aspect of the iris, of the lens. So certainly wrongly positioned here. So this can potentially be the result of trauma. Though when we are dealing with dogs, we would always want to look for the possibility of zonular ligament dysplasia. And so particularly carriers are prone to that problem. And so we can see that they will then, at the very young age, or relatively young age, already develop lens luxation, and will then have the tendency to have this lesion develop bilaterally, in contrast to the other dogs, in contrast to the dogs that do not have this lesion. And basically what for us pathologists that means is looking for this hyaline material that will be surrounding the ciliary body, that is then a reflection of what the zonular fibers look like. And so that poorly formed zonular fiber that should hold the lens in place will not really be able to do its job. And so certainly that weakened structure here will then make the dog be more prone to luxation of the lens. So again, luxation or subluxation of the lens should in dogs always make us look for this change here along the ciliary body as an indication of predisposition that if we see that in the first globe should make us then kind of call the attention that the other globe can eventually then develop this um, luxation or subluxation of the lens as well so coming to the lens uh, remember that there are multiple portions to the lens we have an anterior capsule that is thicker, that allows us, even if the lens falls out and we put it back in the wrong position, still allows us to recognize the anterior aspect versus the posterior that has a thinner capsule. We also have uh, some epithelium along the anterior aspect that will only go to the level of the equator. The posterior aspect lacks that epithelium normally. And uh, we have the cortical region and the nucleus that will correspond to the center. So we may have in older dogs, for instance, the nuclear sclerosis, which is a compaction of all these lens fibers as they get produced more and more over a lifetime and then get kind of compacted down then over the lifetime of the dog. 
Now the change that we see most commonly is cataract, and so we can see the liquefaction here already grossly in this particular case. Histologically, that can look differently. So we have liquefaction, so this lake of protein here, more Dagenian globules that are very common in cataractous lenses. In this particular case here, we also have cells that would should make us look for a rupture site somewhere. Here, some other changes, these bladder cells, very swollen cells that will generally precede where they rupture and form these changes here. And then here we have the posterior aspect of the globe with the thin lens capsule where we have posterior migration of the epithelium and proliferation of it. So again, all of these changes will lead to opacity of the lens, which is what we call cataractous change. Now we have to be careful that we don't misinterpret changes like this as cataractous change, because it can be the result of just fixation, to prolong fixation. And so in this particular case here, um, that was where the lens was kept in Davidson's fixative for too long. We also have some other artifacts here that are more obvious artifacts. But again, we have to be careful that we don't misinterpret this as cataract. There is nothing else. It may just be a fixation artifact. So um, these changes here, in general, we have multiple of these. Mineralization may occur as well. Um, that would really then allow us with confidence to talk about cataract change. Now, other opacities that you may see that are quite interesting, um, though they may not really by itself generally don't cause much in terms of vision disturbance, would be um, basically these asteroid bodies here, asteroid hyalopsis. Here it's just all by itself in an older dog. It can also be seen, and we will talk about iridociliary tumors. It can be seen with iridociliary tumors as well. And so histologically, that is what they look like. And so they are these often bluish because they have some calcium mixed with lipid that will accumulate very characteristically at the posterior aspect of the lens here. And in this particular case, it is one that truly had a tumor. So often we see them if you have these tumors, we will also see these lesions here. Glaucoma. Um, should I still talk about glaucoma now, Leonardo, or should I just keep that for after the break? Leonardo? Should I talk about glaucoma now, or should I leave that for after the break? Yes, you will be able to Okay. So glaucoma is really the most important degenerative disease that we see. And it's a very common reason why globes get enucleated and then sent to a pathologist. And so basically glaucoma means from a clinical perspective that we had increased intraocular pressure that is now causing then pain, but more importantly than blindness because it has an effect onto the retina. And so from pathology perspective, we need to try at least our best in separating between primary and secondary, because secondary processes hopefully would only be affecting one eye. Primary processes are pretty much expected to then also be affecting the other eye as well. And so we need to then point that out to the practitioner, to the referring veterinarian, so that they evaluate the other eye and hopefully then can try to delay glaucoma in that other eye. And so primary, that is the goniodysgenesis, basically where the angle is not well formed. So closed angle glaucoma versus open angle glaucoma that is a lot more common in human medicine, but we also can see that in veterinary medicine as well. And then secondary are those when, where it's acquired, where it's an acquired obstruction at the level of the radiocorneal angle, or <coughs> the problem at the level of the pupil, so basically where we have pupillary blockage. 
So again, it's basically then somewhere along the path of the flow of the aqueous humor that the problem is occurring. And so we need to remember that obviously glaucoma very commonly affects the renal corneal angle, but it may also be at the level of the pupil where there is a problem. So we need to keep in mind the whole path of the aqueous humor as we evaluate the eye. Um, this picture here, or this diagram here, is to show that a good portion of the aqueous humor will go out through this uveoscleral pathway here, and that's what we generally see in dogs and cats. But there is also this other pathway that basically ends up getting it into work. So basically we have one, sorry, I was pointing out the wrong thing here, one going out through the, into the scleral region, the other one going out into the uveal tract, which is much more common in horses. And so if you have, for instance, uh, endophthalmitis in horses, it is very common that you end up seeing neutrophils then extending quite a bit into the uvea because that is where the aqueous humor will tend to go primarily in horses. And so that will then obviously drag with it then anything like neutrophils and so on that may be within the eye. So, and remember that may either go into the uvea, which it does primarily in horses, where there is a lot that goes that way, versus then go out into the scleral region at this level of the renal corneal junction. And the problem of glaucoma is that when there is any obstruction of the outflow, eventually, as I said, we are dealing with this closed structure that will be an effect of that increased intraocular pressure onto the retina, and those ganglion cells that are the innermost cells, innermost neurons, they will end up then dying off, and with that, we basically have blindness that is irreversible. Clinically, that will uh, manifest like this, where you have, because of that increased intraocular pressure, then bufthalmia, and so you have that bulging globe. With that increased intraocular pressure, fluid may be pushing into the cornea, so we have corneal edema, Bentley, this is a dog that would be very painful on that side and also blind. And this intraocular pressure can lead to focal breaks in the decimates. And so that's the, it leads then to the Hobbes stria that we see in this force here. So basically these correspond to these breaks in the decimates, then where we have some fluid leaking into the corneal stroma. And so, again, primary versus acquired or secondary. That is um, the big question in these cases. And so what I find helpful when you have a pig pigmented globe is to try to trace back the pigmented layer that forms the anteriormost aspect of the iris and kind of see if that extends over to the end of the decimates together with the, the rest of the stroma, that is a, kind of basically what I use as a criterion to make the diagnosis of corneal dysgenesis or pectinate ligament dysplasia. And because we would have at least two filtration angles, hopefully you see the same change then also in the other filtration angle represented in your section so that that can then give you further support of the diagnosis of primary glaucoma. One aspect that may be a little confusing is that while well, this represents a congenital malformation, it is something that will generally only manifest in dogs when they are five to eight to even a bit older years of age. And so what is thought is that we already have a malformed angle here and that pigment that may be rubbed off by lens and so on gets accumulated within this malformed filtration angle 
So basically we have some dispersion of pigment that ends up then further blocking the filtration angle to a point where it eventually ends up then blocking completely and leading to buildup of the pressure. So that's why it's not something that manifests right away, but only over time as we have pigment accumulating. And so again, that kind of going along with this, uh, thank you, with evaluating the filtration angle by following along this pigmented layer here that goes up to the cornea, which it should not. And here we have even an abnormal ending of this decinase. So this is then another case of primary glaucoma, which should make you then point out, evaluate the other eye because it probably will eventually develop glaucoma as well. One additional aspect that can help in the diagnosis of, of primary glaucoma is looking for full thickness necrosis of the retina. So it's not really known why, but full thickness necrosis multifocally throughout the retina is an additional characteristic of primary glaucoma. <coughs> Horses can get glaucoma too. There, it is more a diagnosis by exclusion when you're dealing with phonodysgenesis. This was one of the cases where we wondered if that was a malformed angle. And so basically, we had this very th thick pectinate ligament, which horses have generally, and what seemed to be an abnormal decinase. And now, it was really just because this horse did not have anything else and had blindness and loss of ganglion cells and there is really nothing else but glaucoma that leads to that change and to make the diagnosis of primary glaucoma in this particular case. So primary glaucoma of course is making that diagnosis is a little trickier. And it's also tricky, if you will, to recognize open angle glaucoma because the angle is completely open as we have it here at the same time that you have extreme cupping in some of those cases, that would give you the idea of the intraocular, of the increased intraocular pressure in these cases. So again, that kind of is then what allows you to make the diagnosis of glaucoma despite the open angle. So again, open angle glaucoma. Beagles are one of the dog breeds and, and they have been used to study that further. In cats, it is thought that it is the scleral vasculature that may undergo some changes that may close, and so you don't have all that fluid being able to go out the globe. And that it's probably some changes in the connective tissue that just don't allow the fluid to flow as usual. That probably underlies this type of glaucoma. Uh, in, in one of these, Beagles with open angle glaucoma, they already saw these little newborn puppies with ophthalmos. So it's a problem that can potentially manifest even at the time of birth already in these puppies. In secondary glaucoma, they are generally more easily kind of diagnosed because there you would then be looking for some predisposing changes. And so this paper here lists them and you can see that uveitis is very often then what ends up predisposing them to acquired glaucomas. So basically we have a, something that blocks the anterior aspect of the globe. It can be at the level of the pupil and or at the level of the radio corneal formation. In this particular case here it is very obvious that we have that excessive fibrous tissue accumulating in that region secondary to uveitis. And then just something to <coughs> keep an eye out is this aqueous humor misdirection syndrome that was characterized by Dick Dobilcic and his group. In these cats here, if you compare the normal to the affected ones, you can see how shallow the anterior chamber is. That's much more readily noticeable clinically then we may see it histologically. But it's thought that it is because the vitreous is pushing forward and that that is because the aqueous humor is leaking into the vitreous, forming these pockets here 
And is this placing, therefore, then the vitreous forward to where we end up then kind of increasing the pressure within the globe that way? In all of these cases, regardless of what the underlying cause is, whether it's primary, secondary, and what the secondary issue potentially is, in all of those cases of glaucoma, the first thing that you will see is loss of these ganglion cells. So if you have loss of these ganglion cells, the only thing that can do that is glaucoma. So that makes that diagnosis for us easy. And though we have to be careful that we don't overinterpret kind of because of sectioning a somewhat reduced number of ganglion cells. You need, you need to be convinced that they are truly missing. And in cats and horses, that is all you will see. In dogs, that atrophy can get to be much more severe. And so here, I apologize, this ended up because of formatting issue, kind of a little displaced. But this one here is the tapetal region of a dog that in the non tapetal region had severe atrophy, and sometimes it gets to be just a very thin membrane, um, where we end up then losing not just the ganglion cells, but pretty much all the other cells within the retina as well. Now, just to finish this up with a few additional causes of retinal atrophy, again, inner retinal atrophy with loss of ganglion cells, the only thing that can do that is glaucoma. Outer retinal atrophy, there are much more things that can do that. So here we have what we have missing. We have the inner ganglion cell layer, we have the inner uh, nuclear layer, but it's the outer layers that are missing. In this particular case, we're looking at the mouse, and there are a number of strains that have the RB1 gene that make them prone to retinal atrophy. So if we would want to do behavioral studies, for instance, in mice, we have to be careful that we don't choose strains that have this kind of problem here that will eventually get blind and that may affect then the behavior of those animals. In this particular case here, it is a sheep that was getting bracken firm, Pteridium aquilinum. So you can see that this is another one where the ganglion cells are preserved the inner nuclear layer in this sheet here, um, kind of a normal, and the outer nuclear layer kind of are clearly distinguishable in contrast to this affected one where the outer nuclear layer ended up, or the outer aspect of the retina got so atrophied that we basically have now everything kind of blending together and in a completely blind sheet. So that's a toxic change of atrophy. And then what in horses has been thought to perhaps be associated with vascular damage by herpes virus, though this has not been proven so far, is a focal atrophy, again, of the outer layer where the retinal pigmented epithelium here is completely missing and the retina is completely attached to the deeper aspect. So here we have that in a rat. Again, the adhesion of the retina to basically areas where the retinal pigment epithelium is missing. And the, in rats, it's called linear retinopathy. It's not really known what the cause of that change is. Now, um, retinal detachment. Uh, remember, that is a problem that happens very easily because we have those two layers, the retina and the RPE, just very kind of loosely attached since the time of embryology. And so it is anything that may come between the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium, and the retina, may it be blood, may it be effusion, anything can end up leading to retinal detachment. So here, we have another one. Here it's a little trickier to make the call whether that is true change versus just postmortem, um, because it can also be a postmortem change. And histology may then be needed to make that call. Having the tomb stoning of the retinal pigment epithelium really helps us pathologists to then confirm that we have true retinal detachment. You can see that we have some atrophy here of the photoreceptors, 
So that makes it even more convincing that that is a true change. But again, remember, we can see this detachment even as a postmortem change because that opposition is so loose. <coughs> now, when we have a lot of bleeding into that area, one of the things that we always have to investigate are these vascular changes. And so we barely see the lumen, but we have a lot of fibrin deposition in the vascular wall. You can do PES to basically confirm that change. This is a normal vessel with just a little bit of PES staining and a very large open lumen. The lumen is barely visible here or not at all, really. Um, so this is typical of hypertension. And so hypertensive chorioretinopathy leading to bleeding within the globe. Um, that is always something. So here again, we have a lot of blood within the globe. And we always have to remember to investigate whether this could be an underlying hypertension case. And that would then have those vascular changes I just showed you. Uh, in this particular case here, there were already some hemostidin laden macrophages. And it can certainly be caused by trauma. It can have coagulopathies of some other sorts. Even ehrlichia or so can potentially lead to vascular changes can end up culminating in intraocular hemorrhage. So we cannot really make the diagnosis of any of those other diseases except for hypertension that we always need to investigate because that is a systemic disease that we need to let the veterinarian know. So, just to kind of wrap this portion up, um, an end stage, if a disease has, if, if a globe has some disease that will be left untreated or even potentially treated, but will be progressive, you may end up with a globe that will eventually shrink in size, which can be clinically then again a bit difficult to differentiate from microphthalmia, as we can see how large the orbit is and how small this globe is here. Uh, in one of the cases that we were dealing with, they had seen that shrinkage of the globe, but really only noticed when they were enucleating that there was a stick that was going into the globe. This horse had run against the fence, and so a little stick from the fence ended up poking into the globe and so basically led to some atrophy. So here we have the stick, and or you have to imagine the stick. They had taken it out before they send it for a histopath. But the stick was kind of penetrating into the globe and was leading to some fibrosis and initial shrinkage of this globe. In this particular case, we can still recognize a lot of the rest. We can still recognize we have some of the lens here, we have the uveal tract, we have the vitreos, and so on. So in this particular case, atrophia bulbi would be the better term to use. In contrast to a globe like this, where you can barely recognize anything, and that is really, really small, Histologically, those globes may even have bone formation, and the only layer that you can often identify is the uveal tract. This is where thesis bulbi is then the best term to use. So again, the intermediate stage is atrophia bulbi, so it's getting atrophied. When it gets to the end stage, thesis bulbi is then the best term to use. And that would take me, would bring me to the end of these degenerative diseases. Um, is there any question on these diseases? Thesis bulbi, atrophia bulbi, may be the end stage of inflammatory diseases too. And so we will then talk about those inflammatory diseases then after the break. But I think now would be then the time to have coffee break. Yeah. So if you want to give some instructions for that. Then, and then we'll continue afterwards. So, which is the best practice for fixation of eyes? Uh, Put on in the formula or inject the. So, what I, like, what I like to do is injecting 
the glow already so that it maintains its brown shape. And it will then also be a little firmer than it would if you didn't inject it. And then basically, yeah, if unless there is a history of tumor or some other lesion that is not in the vertical section. So if I have glaucoma or if I have a diffuse inflammatory process within the eye, then I get a vertical section. And a friend of mine, he said that in addition to getting one vertical section, he also then, so he has the two halves of the eye, of which he puts one basically then for, for his half. He also gets a perpendicular section then of the other half. So that way he has three filtration angles to look at if, he, if there is a suspicion of blood. So that's how he would go on the train. And what is important then for the pathologist in the room is that also when you trim, it has a really sharp instrument. And so whether that is, I know some people who use just very sharp knives. And I often use blades that we use as a microtool. So that's the kind of blade that I use then for trimming the eyes. 